Hi, in this lecture, we'll talk about finite element method for the Stokes equation. So on our way towards the navier Stokes equation. Previously, we talked about the advection diffusion equation. Now we're going to talk about the Stokes equation, and then we're going to talk about the navier Stokes equation. But before all of that, I need to uh, quickly review our notation and also navier Stokes equation that you uh, probably have seen in your graduate level fluid mechanics courses. So we uh, have the rate of strain tensor S, which is the symmetric part of the velocity gradient. So one half of grad V plus grad V transpose, also written in index notation. Uh, like this. So you have these, uh, you know, um, nine components uh, of the symmetric uh, uh, tensor uh, in, in a 3D problem. So this is an example in car, uh, uh, rectangular and cylindrical coordinates. And then we have in, when we talk about the momentum equation, either the Stokes or number Stokes equations, we have the uh, constitutive equation that relates the stress tensor to the kinematics and deformations in the flow. So that's uh, through this equation, you have the stress tensor sigma, which has the pressure part, which is isotropic. So I is an uh, identity tensor. So P is the pressure. And then you have the viscous stress tensor contribution, which for a Newtonian fluid is two times mu dynamic viscosity times S, the strain rate tensor. And then you can also have compressibility effects uh, uh, here, uh, if your flow is compressible. And then finally, when you go to the uh, cons uh, conservation of momentum equations, you, you have these uh, Cauchy equations, really, where you have on the left hand side acceleration, so density times acceleration for a fluid, which has the local and convective accelerations. And then on the right hand side, you have divergence of sigma, uh, divergence of the stress tensor, and then also. Uh, uh, gravity or body forces. So once you, if you plug in for this definition of sigma for a Newtonian fluid into this Cushing's equation, you're going to get the form of Navier-Stokes equation that you're, you've seen in your undergraduate fluid mechanics classes. Okay, great. So now we're going to be using this notation uh, for the rest of this lecture. Uh, so uh, we have the velocity gradient. Okay, so V is going to be our velocity. So V1, V2, V3 are the velocity in X, Y, Z directions. We have the strain rate tensor. And then we have this uh, constitutive equation which I just talked about for that relates uh, pressure, uh, stress to deformation or rate of deformation. And uh, we can have compressibility effect. So, uh, so, so in here we will ignore the, this compressibility effect. So we're going to derive the weak forms for the incompressible Stokes equations. So we have this, uh, uh, well, of course, the compressibility effects really, uh, you, know, you know, just more generally in the context of Navier-Stokes, we will not be talking about the compressibility effects uh, uh, in uh, where, even when we go to the Navier-Stokes equation, we'll mainly emphasize the incompressible uh, equation. And it turns out that the incompressible equations are actually possess certain numerical difficulties uh, that we will also talk about. So uh, we have these uh, incompressible Navier-Stokes equations that you see here. We have the M conservation of momentum, or F equals MA. And then we have the conservation of mass, which says that divergence of velocity is equal to zero. Uh, so for steady Stokes equations, so low Reynolds number of flows, uh, what we have is uh, we essentially we assume the flow is steady, so we don't have partial partial t, and then we also don't have the inertial term. So we have divergence of sigma that's balanced by external body forces. So that's our, you know, uh, momentum equation, if you like. And then we have conservation of mass, divergence of velocity equals zero. And just like before, we're gonna assume this portion of the boundary belongs to the Dirichlet boundary, where we exactly know the velocity. This could be, for example, an inlet boundary condition. And parts of the boundary belongs to the Newman boundary condition, where we know the traction. So this is typically done on the outlet boundary condition for fluid flow. So now here, traction is basically, if you take the stress tensor and you done it with the normal vector, so it's kind of like a matrix vector multiplication, you get another vector, which is what we call traction. So the way to see the concept of traction is that if you recall stress, stress is a tensor quantity because it's really force divided by area and force is a vector. Area is also a vector because different, we can talk about different orientations, different surfaces with different 
orientation. So it's really not just the magnitude of the area, but also its orientation, which is defined by normal vector. So that makes area also in this context a vector. So really stress becomes you, know, you can think of stress as a tensor that has directionality from the force direction and also the surface direction. So now when you fix the surface, so on the Newman boundary, so when we're talking about stress on a boundary, in this case, the Newman boundary, we are fixing the surface, okay? So the normal vector n, you know, and the surface is fixed here. So we, since we know the surface, um, we, uh, our stress tensor really now becomes just a vector because now it's just about the directionality of force. So, and that is what we call attraction. So now a stress, you know, you can kind of think of traction as think as tra think of traction as a uh, as a stress vector. Okay, so it's, it's your stress tensor with the direction of the surface fixed. Okay, so you know which surface you're talking about. In this case, the Newman boundary. Okay, so we assume that is also known. For example, a common choice is attraction free outlet boundary condition, which means that you set this value equal to zero on that. Now, let's work on deriving the uh, weak form of the equation. So for the Stokes equation, so we have the trail uh, space. Uh, so uh, this is uh, the space of all possible fun uh, solutions. So these are all functions belonging to H1 and we impose a constraint of the Dirichlet boundary condition on the space of function, admissible functions. And then we also have the weight function, the space for weight functions. So if you're gonna show it W, the solution here in this lecture, we're gonna show it with V. So it's and V and W in this case are vectors. So since we're solving for a vector in this case, a velocity vector, our weight function, our test function is also a vector. So W is also a vector. And we also have another unknown here. We're solving for pressure, and pressure is a scalar field. Uh, so P and its corresponding weight function, Q, are scalars. And the space for pressure is this capital Q space, which we only require pressure to be L2, so only be square integrable. We do not need its uh, derivative to be square integrable, and that's because of the way the weak forms turn out to be for the Navier-Stokes or Stokes equation. So the weak form becomes as follows. We want to find V and P belonging, in, belonging to this space S and Q such that for any test function W belonging to this space of weight functions or Q belonging to, again, space of capital Q, these two equations are satisfied. And these two equations, the first equation is just our momentum equation for Stokes equation, multiplied both sides by the weight function W and integrated. And the second one is simply the divergence free condition, conservation of mass multiplied by Q and integrate. So for integration by parts, we're going to be doing that on the uh, on the, the stress term. Okay, so an equation one, we are going to be performing integration by parts. Uh, so uh, when we do that, you know, if you consider the divergence of sigma term, uh, you wanna take the gradient from sigma and give it to the weight function W. And this is what happens. Uh, if you take the gradient from sigma, give it to W, you get grad W. Now keep in mind, W is a vector, right? In this case, the weight functions are a vector and gradient of a vector is a, is a second order tensor. And sigma stress is also second order tensor. So you have two second order tensors somehow multiplied by each other, and you want to get a scalar at the end. You want these integrals to give you scalars. So the appropriate, you know, really product here is this tensor tensor double dot product. So this is a double dot product, which we talked about briefly before, that takes two tensors, multiplied by each other, and gives you a scalar. So this is just a reminder of what this double dot product is between two answers. Okay, now this is my integration by parts here. So I've taken the gradient from sigma, given it to W, change the sign, so minus becomes positive. And then I also gotta, I'm also going to have a boundary term, where for the boundary term, gradient is replaced with n, the normal vector, and the sign is kept the same. So this is your boundary term. Now, 
sigma dotted with n, this is nothing but traction that we talked about. And we know exactly what traction is. On the new boundary, it's equal to t, which is the value given to us, the traction or the stress vector. And then uh, w, uh, the weight function, as you know, it's zero, as we talked about before, on the Dirichlet bound. So this becomes our final form of the weak form. Okay, so the Newman term that you see here is only on the Newman boundary with a known traction T. So the right-hand side is known, the left-hand side contains our unknowns that appear within sigma. And you're gonna see in a moment as we replace sigma with the constitutive equation. But before we do that, this is a principle of virtual work. The left-hand side represents virtual work of internal forces, uh, and the right-hand side represents virtual work of external forces. So, you know, we talked about this before that this W you can think of them as virtual displacements or virtual velocity in this case. And within that variational context, you can think of this as a virtual work principle. Okay, so now we want to uh, simplify sigma. So write it in terms of the unknown velocity vectors V. So we write, we assume, uh, you know, incompressible. So this is the Stokes equation, of course, so incompressible. Um, and also we assume Newtonian fluid. So we have this constitutive equation. Then uh, we have, we, we want to plug in for this term. So instead of sigma, I'm going to put minus P times I, the identity tensor, plus two mu times S, the symmetric part of the velocity gradient. So if you plug that in, S will just appear and replace sigma with this factor two times viscosity. And for the pressure term, you're going to get pressure times divergence of W. Now, the way to see this is a simple, very short exercise. If you know, uh, if, you, if you're familiar with Einstein index notation from either your continuum mechanics classes or your gradual level fluid mechanics class, you if you write this in index notation, you can easily prove that uh, this part of when you plug in sigma, the pressure part gives you this term. So basically, gradient of W, if you like, is grad I W J, I and J being your index, multiplied by sigma I J, right? So in this case, I and J are both dumb indices. You do this multiplication, you get a scale. Now, when you plug in for P, I, for I, P is just a scalar, so it doesn't have any index. I is delta I J, right? So. That's your chronicle delta. So when you have grad i w j multiplied by p delta i j, delta i j will make the indices the same. That's what it does and it gets multiplied. So grad w instead of grad i w j becomes grad j w j. And grad j w j is nothing but divergence of w. So w is a vector. Divergence of w in index notation is grad j w j, which J is a um, repeating index and gives you a scalar, which you, so you expect for divergence of a vector. And then you also have the multiplication by P there, okay? So this is how this is derived. And then, uh, you know, just like before, you use a collection formulation, you replace your unknown um, B, your velocity, and P, your trial functions with these basis functions, same thing, and you have the nodal degrees of freedom, V, A, P, A, and then you, for uh, the similarity for the weights and uh, weight functions for test functions for velocity and pressure. So now, if you do the, this, if you just plug this in and you integrate over each element and assemble, at the end of the day, this is the weak form that we get, and you we get different matrices. So we have this matrix, which comes from the grad w double dot s term. So that matrix we're going to show it with k, so kind of like a stiffness matrix similar to the diffusion matrix we had previously for the mass transfer problems. We have this P divergence of W term, which comes from the pressure part of the constitutive equation, which we're gonna show you the matrix G. Then if you remember, we also had a second equation. We didn't do anything to this divergence free equation, but that also gives us another equation, which here I'm showing this part here, which you can think of as a transpose of this matrix, G transpose. And if you like, you can also do integration by parts on this as well. So Q times divergence of V, you can move the derivatives. The sign becomes positive. Gradient applied to Q 
Q, remember, it's a scalar because it's a weight function corresponding to pressure. Gradient of a scalar is a vector. The dot product of a vector and V, which is another vector, is a scalar as we expect. So this is the integration of parts here. And then we have the right-hand side force term. So if you put all the equations next to each other, we have two a system of equations. We have two equations, really. Uh, we have, uh, okay, so we have the, uh, the first sets of equation, which comes from the momentum equation. So that's K times V plus GP. So G, uh, that's the pressure part of the constitutive equation, equals to our F, the body force, and the traction boundary condition, or the Newman boundary condition. And then we also have uh, the second equation, which is conservation of mass. So if you put them into this block matrices, matrix equation, you have the system of equation that you need to solve. The first one involves both velocity and pressure. The second equation only involves velocity. Now, this means that pressure is absent in the second equation. In the continuity equation, you do not have pressure. So here you have this big zero matrix, so this block matrix, okay? And it turns out a big reason why solving incompressible navier stokes equations is challenging is because of this zero that you see here. So this zero here causes lots of numerical difficulties when you go ahead and want to solve these couple systems of equations. So uh, from a physical point of view, you can also understand this difficulty because pressure is really the force that's responsible for conservation of mass and continuity. Velocity is divergence-free in incompressible flows because of pressure. You know, if you consider a rigid tank with water, you try to compress it, no matter how hard you try, you're not gonna be able to compress water. Of course, assuming it doesn't explode, the tank doesn't explode, you will not be able to compress water. And the entire reason you can't compress it is because of pressure. Pressure builds up inside water that resists compressibility. So pressure is really the magical force. You can think of it as a Lagrange multiplier in the mathematics sense that uh, is enforcing this uh, divergence-free condition, the second equation. However, itself doesn't even appear in that equation. In the divergence of velocity equals zero, in the incompressibility condition, there's no pressure. You get these zeros here, even though pressure is really what's responsible for that phenomenon. So that's really the kind of like a conflict here from the physics point of view that mathematically also translates itself into difficulty in solving these types of matrices with this block of zero. Then you can learn more about this if you consult with linear algebra textbooks about what are the challenges here in solving these types of uh, matrix equations. Now, in practice, to overcome this, there are different ways to do it. The one approach is the so-called LBB compatibility condition, which you know, in practice very, you know, an easy way to achieve this is simply use a higher order approximation for velocity than pressure. For example, if your shape func functions in, your, in velocity, these n shape functions in velocity are quadratic, you use, uh, you use quadratic for velocity and then use linear for pressure. For example, the P2, P1 elements. Um, another way is that you could use stabilization for incompressibility and pressure you can stabilize pressure we should talk more about that uh, the other approach is you can um, use a fractional steps method instead of this coupled velocity pressure method to overcome this challenge which we will also talk about in future lectures